speaker, uh, Professor Amir Sufi, who is the Bruce Lindsay Professor of Economics and Public Policy at the University of Chicago. He is also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and serves as an associate editor for the American Economic Review, the Journal of Finance, and the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Professor Sufi was awarded the 2017 Fisher Black Prize by the American Finance Association, which is given biannually to the top financial economic scholar under the age of 40. Uh, Professor Suri, Sufi, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We are very honored to uh, have you here with us today. Uh, you may take the floor for the next 45 minutes. Thank you. Well, first, I want to say uh, thank you to Raf and Olivier for, for the invitation. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here. Um, so the title of the presentation is The Role of Inequality in Finance and Macroeconomics. And this is basically all work uh, that's joint with Atif Mian at Princeton and Ludwig Straub at Harvard. And the central point that we're trying to make in this uh, agenda is that inequality is more than an issue just of distribution and fairness. It's, it's that, of course, but it's also an issue that financial uh, economists and macroeconomists should care about because we think it actually affects aggregates in a very important way. So this is going to be based on three papers, Indebted Demand, which is already published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, The Saving Glut of the Rich, uh, which we're just uh, doing a revision of right now, and the Jackson Hole paper that we wrote uh, last year, or I guess, yeah, a year, a year and a couple months ago. So what's the basic point? The basic point uh, starts with the, the, the notion that in most macroeconomic models, shifts in the distribution of permanent income in the long run are neutral for key macroeconomic aggregates. That's a point made nicely by Ludwig in his job market paper. So it can affect cyclical variation, but in terms of long run steady state outcomes, in general, most macroeconomic models uh, don't have a role uh, for a rise in permanent income inequality. This, however, ignores the fact that saving rates out of permanent income are higher for the rich, a point that was uh, mentioned in the last talk, in Unsker's talk. So what we do in this uh, agenda is to explore empirically and theoretically the implications of rising permanent income inequality uh, for the overall economy. And as I mentioned, the key insight is that inequality is more than an issue of fairness. Uh, inequality matters for key macroeconomic aggregates, the financial system, and for policy. This, of course, is all... Uh, written in the context of this picture, and most of you know this picture, which is uh, 23 advanced economies weighted by GDP, the rise in the share of income going to the top 1% over the last 40 years. Um, I want to make a note that research, especially out of the U.S., where I think we have the best data, shows that this is not just a rise of, say, transitory income shocks, but this is the permanent component of income that's gone up. Um, so permanent income inequality has risen quite a lot over the last 40 years. Here it's about five to six percentage points uh, in terms of that rise. And again, the point is, do we really think that this trend would be neutral for macroeconomic aggregates? Our argument is that it's not, and we need to think about how to incorporate that into our models. What I'm going to do is talk about some empirical facts from the Saving Glut of the Rich paper and the Jackson Hole paper. That's going to be kind of my motivation. And then I'll spend most of the time going through the model and data demand, talking about the implications for policy. And then I want to conclude by thinking about COVID uh, and the post-COVID world and what we may have to say about that uh, from this model. A paper that was cited in the last presentation, so maybe I can go through it quickly, is the famous Dinan, Skinner, and Zeldis paper, which shows saving rates out of both current and measures of permanent income. This is their, permanent in their current income estimates, but showing that people in the top 1% of the income distribution tend to have a saving rate out of income that's about 50%, uh, 50 cents on the dollar, whereas people, let's say, in the 60th to 80th percentile of the distribution have a saving rate that's only about 17%. So that was an initial paper. They also looked at measures of permanent income and they make the argument that it's not just that people are saving because they ended up in the top one because of a transitory income shock, but even out of measures of normal income, people in the top part of the income distribution tend to save more in the long run. 
Ludwig in his job market paper looked at the panel study of income dynamics, the PSID in the US, and basically makes the point that a homothetic model, a model in which the consumption saving decision is independent of permanent income, would have the feature that if you look at the cross section over long time periods, the elasticity of consumption with respect to income should be one. That is, the dots on this picture should lie on the red line, the 45 degree line. Ludwig looks at the data, shows that in fact it does not lie on the red line. Instead, it, relies on, it lies on that blue line where the slope is less than one. Again, meaning people who are higher in the income distribution measuring a longer run measure of income, a more permanent income measure, tend to consume less out of that income than people in the lower part of the income distribution. So Unsgar mentioned this paper in the last presentation, our Jackson Hole paper, in which we looked across the income and age distribution to try to estimate saving rates using the Survey of Consumer Finances Plus, this excellent data put together by Moritz Schulerich and his co-authors. Uh, again, this is focused on the US data, where I think we have the best data uh, to estimate saving rates. I want to emphasize that this is a within birth cohort comparison. So we're fixing essentially when you're born and now comparing people across the income distribution of people born around the same time. And again, you find the same result that people in the top 10% tend to have a saving rate out of income that's about 20 cents on the dollar. This is about in line with what Dine and Skinner and Zeldis found. The 50 cents on the dollar was the top 1%, if you remember. So the top 10% ends up being about 20 cents on the dollar, whereas the bottom 50% have a saving rate that's only about uh, 15 cents on the dollar. So these are the microeconomic facts that we motivate our analysis with. Let me mention one more that I don't have uh, a picture for, but is from the European data, the household data, uh, the household survey data that many scholars have used and were presenting today and yesterday. There is a set of scholars that have been looking at estimating the marginal propensity to consume out of capital gains in the stock market, which is actually the empirical object that is closest to what we actually motivate the indebted demand model. And those scholars are finding, consistent with this evidence, that the marginal propensity to consume out of a capital gain in the stock market, which under the assumption of random walk is really a permanent change in your wealth, is much lower for people at the high end of the wealth distribution. So again, if we drop wealth on someone in the top 1%, they're gonna consume less out of it than if we drop wealth on, the top, on people in the bottom 50%. That's gonna be a very important fact when we go to the model. So in addition to the microeconomic evidence, we've also been looking at more macroeconomic figures to kind of motivate this analysis. This is from the Jackson Hole paper, but really comes from our Saving Glut of the Rich paper. Here, we're just taking the nominal amount of savings. So this is not a saving rate. This is just the nominal amount of savings scaled by aggregate nominal national income, okay? And we're just showing where is it coming from in the US, uh, in what part of the distribution. And as you can see here, um, you can see that uh, a lot of it is starting in the 1980s, you see this pretty sharp rise in the amount of saving coming from people in the top 10%. At the same time, you see a pretty sharp decline in the amount of saving coming from people in the bottom 90%. And so if we're gonna tell a saving push story for why interest rates have come down, it's really about thinking about this top 10% because that's really where the savings are coming from. In a really nice paper that uh, followed up our Saving Glut of the Rich paper, uh, Moritz Schulerich and his co-authors implement a very similar methodology for China, the Europe, and the, and the US, and essentially reproduce almost the exact same figure, including both Europe and the US in it. So again, if we look at where savings to national income ratios are coming from, they're coming from people in the top 10%. And so when we think about Ansgar's paper, if we think about Germany, we think about China, countries that are producing current account surpluses, it's really the rich people in those countries that are creating those current account surpluses. That's where the saving is coming from. The title of their paper, which I really love, is The Anatomy of the Global Saving Glut, where they're basically saying the global saving glut really is a saving glut of the rich in that the countries producing current account surpluses are those that are having a large rise in income inequality and therefore a large rise in savings coming from the rich. 
There's one point I do want to mention on this slide, which is very important, which there was some uh, discussion of this in the last talk. What Moritz Schulerich and his co-authors point out in this agenda, and we also point out in our Saving Glut of the Rich paper, is you must take into account the claim that rich folks have on the corporate sector when you're calculating saving rates. Okay, it's incredibly important because the corporate savings glut, which many of you know about, is reflected in this picture. That is, you need to disintermediate the corporate sector. Who owns corporations? Primarily rich people. And Unsgar very nicely pointed that out, that, you know, that when we're thinking about where a lot of the savings is being done, it's being done within businesses. Sometimes for tax purposes, you're not taxed on the dividends you keep in your businesses in many countries. And so the saving glut of the rich is, at least in part, part, you know, is this corporate savings glut. So it's the same phenomenon. Don't think of them as competing with each other. They're all basically rich people saving either in their businesses or uh, on their own account. That raises, of course, a very interesting question, which is, are the corporations saving because the rich people want them to? Either, in either way, either way, they are, in fact, saving, and that represents a claim on cash from, from, uh, that rich people have. In the saving glut of the rich, what we do, and this is going to play a very important role in the modeling assumptions that we make in the model I'm about to head to, we show an exercise which we call unveiling the financial sector. Okay? What we mean by that is, we ultimately care about where the money that the flow of savings coming from the rich ends up. And to do that, you kind of have to unveil the financial sector, doing a pretty complicated methodology using the financial accounts data. And if you do that, what you realize is a lot of the money that is being saved into the financial system by the rich is ending up in borrowing by the non-rich, and in particular in mortgages. Okay, so mechanically what this picture is showing you is what we call the net household debt position. That's the amount of assets you have as a financial asset. Um, I'm sorry, the amount of household debt you hold as a financial asset minus the amount you're borrowing. Okay, that's your net household debt position. And you can see that that goes up quite substantially for people in the high part of the income, uh, uh, income distribution. Whereas the net household debt position for the bottom 90% has been collapsing. Now those of you who are clever realize this of course has to add up to one when we're thinking about where people are borrowing from. The fact that the blue line is not going up as much as the red line is going down shows you that the US bottom 90% is not only borrowing from the top 10%, but they're also borrowing from overseas, right? So in about in equal proportion, we show that Really, when we're thinking about where the bottom 90% are borrowing from, half of it's from the rest of the world, and half of it's from the bot top 10% within the US. OK, so now let me go to the model. You're going to see why this idea that when the rich save, it ends up in the debt position of the non-rich. It's going to play a crucial role in the indebted demand model that I'm about to produce. OK, so here's the model. It's a deterministic infinite horizon model, um, endowment economy. In the paper, I'm going to do kind of, given this is a, more of a keynote lecture, I'm going to do kind of the high-level version of the paper. A lot more details are actually in the paper itself. I'm happy to take those in questions in the Q&A. So for example, in the paper, we add investment, and we think about how investment would change. But here it's just going to be an endowment economy populated by two separate dynasties. I'm going to call them borrowers and savers, although that's technically an endogenous outcome. They become borrowers and savers. Probably a better label would just be rich and non-rich. Um, they just differ in terms of their endowments. So there's no preference heterogeneity. Those of you who work with these models know some people have preference heterogeneity. Everyone has the same preferences here, but they have different endowments, okay? I purposely use the term non-rich instead of poor. That's important. I don't want you to be thinking of the bottom 10%. I want you to be thinking of the bottom 90%, maybe even the bottom 95%. So that's why I use the term non-rich. Some of these people are pretty high in the wealth distribution. If you want to think about who we're talking about, think of kind of an upper middle class individual who has to borrow to buy their home. That's who I'm really thinking of when I'm thinking of the non-rich. You have these endowments of trees. 
but you can't trade them directly. Only you can trade is debt contracts. So we can write debt contracts and that's going to be the way the non-rich and the rich in this model interact with each other. Each dynasty is going to die at the rate of delta and the wealth is going to be inherited by offspring. One of the things we explore in the paper is what if you have switching, like if you have intergenerational switching, and that's going to mute a lot of the forces that we have in this model. Here's where the model really is special or different in some ways is in the utility function. Now everybody has identical utility, um, so it's not that we have preference heterogeneity, but we do have this VA term. Otherwise, the model's quite standard. We use log uh, over we use log preferences over consumption, but that's not crucial. We can either e easily change that to CRRA. It just makes it, uh, the analysis a little bit more complicated. Um, this budget constraints very standard. So let's talk a little bit about what VA is here. Um, what did Unsker call it? Capitalist spirit, you know, I guess that's one term people are using. But here, we want to think about it generally as any force that gives you kind of utility over your assets, over your wealth. Here, we model is it a bequest utility, so you only get this if you die, right? That's why it's scaled by delta there. Um, and it could represent status benefits from wealth, gifts uh, to relatives uh, for charities, inter, -viv inter vivos transfers, all of these things will be captured by VA. The key object, and this is what I want you to keep in mind as we go forward, is the marginal utility of VA relative to log, which we call A to A, uh, which is defined as A V prime A. The shape of A to A is the crucial feature of this model which is if A to A is increasing in A, which is what we think is the most realistic case, then we have what we call a non-homothetic model, and that's going to lead to a lot of differences relative to the standard model. A homothetic model, well, we all know how to solve that from like undergraduate macro, right? So, uh, or even micro, right? So if VA is log, then you have a standard kind of consumption in the first period, consumption in the second period model, with the exception of that delta there. And everything would be homothetic, meaning it doesn't matter how rich you are, you would have the same share of consumption allocated to the two periods, regardless of how rich you are. And that is more or less what's being used in most standard macroeconomic models. So the A to A increasing in A, which we think is empirically more realistic, is really the feature that makes this model kind of go. Uh, makes it different than a standard model. The rest of the model is pretty standard. Um, your total wealth is going to represent not only your endowment, the present value of your endowment, PI here is the discount rate, um, and DTI is going to be the amount of your net financial position vis-a-vis -vis the other group, right? So for rich folks, that's going to be a negative number, meaning you have a negative debt position you're lending to the non-rich, uh, whereas D is going to be positive in equilibrium uh, for the non-rich. The other crucial equation that's going to help us determine the steady state is the borrowing constraint. The borrowing constraint in the basic model I'm presenting to you today is very simple. It's an LTV constraint. L is going to be essentially how much you can borrow against the present value of your income. We don't literally have housing here, but I think of that as kind of housing. Housing is going to be really how I interpret this model, and I'll explain that as we go along. Okay. Market clearing is going to pin down the uh, nominal interest, or I'm sorry, the real interest rate in this paper, and the key st state variable is going to be the debt of the borrowers. Okay, so we're going to show some dynamics, but you should think of this paper as primarily being a paper about long-run steady states. That's what we're interested in here: is how does that non-homothetic affect long-run steady states of this economy? So let's talk about how all of this is going to work in equilibrium. So. To solve this model in steady state, we're going to start with the Euler equation of the saver. Okay? The Euler equation of the saver would look completely standard, right? this part, you've all seen that before, if it weren't for this term. So if A to A um, is uh, positive, that's going to end up uh, making a big difference in terms of how that steady state condition is going to look like. So let's go ahead and show the steady state. The steady state setting consumption growth to zero and solving for R basically gives you the equilibrium condition on the long run steady state interest rate in this economy. You can see if A to A was equal to one, which it would be in a homothetic model, then everything's going to cancel here and you're going to be left with the standard condition that the real interest rate is going to be equal to the discount rate of the saver in the model, something we've all seen in, in, in our standard macro models um, that most of us use. Okay. 
Now, how will R look different in equilibrium if A to A is not equal to 1? That is, if we move away from a homothetic model, well, in that case, A to A is going to shape the, uh, have, uh, is going to determine the shape of the saving supply curve, which I'm about to show you on the next slide. Okay? Now, again, what does A to A being positive really mean? It means that the marginal utility that you get from having wealth goes up if, if you get richer. And again, it goes up relative to the log case, right? So of course, there's always diminishing marginal utility of having wealth as you get richer. But A to A being positive means that it's, it's, you, your, your marginal utility doesn't kind of go, it's not as concave, right? You, you still get more and more margin, your marginal utility ends up being higher the richer you get relative to the log case. And that's what's really going to make this model uh, different than the standard model. So let's see that in a graph. So on the vertical axis of this graph is the real interest rate. On the horizontal axis is the wealth of the saver, which is also going to be the debt of the borrower in part. And a homothetic model would have this being constant, right? And of course, that's going to be equal to rho. I just showed you that, right? So in a homothetic model, that's going to be equal to rho. In a non-homothetic model in which saving is a luxury good, it's going to be downward sloping. Okay? And just to make sure everyone understands what this curve is, this is a set of long-run steady-state equilibria. Right? You give me the asset position of the rich, I tell you what the long-run equilibrium interest rate that clears this economy is going to be. So what's the intuition on this thing being downward sloping? The downward slope reflects the fact that as the rich get richer, their marginal utility relative to the log case remains high and remains higher than it would in the, in the log case, and you therefore have to keep them from saving more. And the only way to keep them from saving more is to lower the equilibrium interest rate. So the idea is if Bill Gates gets more and more wealth, Bill Gates wants to save more. That's where non-homotheticity says. But you can only keep the get Bill Gates' consumption growth constant if you lower the interest rate. You have to disincentivize the rich person as they get richer from saving too much. That's the core intuition for a downward slo sloping saving supply curve. So what's the steady state look like? In this model with the downward saving supply curve, we now enter the debt demand curve. Notice what's changed here is I've switched out assets of the rich with debt of the non-rich, of course, that's the same thing in this, pay, in, this, in this model. The rich have their uh, endowment income, but they also have in, uh, wealth from basically lending to the non-rich. The debt demand curve is much easier to understand and much, simp you know, much more standard. It just reflects the fact that as the discount rate falls in this economy, the wealth position of the borrower goes up, LTV is constant, and so they can borrow more. Right? So they get to borrow more as the interest rate falls, and again, that's coming off their endowment being worth more, and they can therefore borrow more against it. So now you can probably see where the housing analogy is coming from. Right? So in the real world, anything that's pushing down house prices, I'm sorry, pushing down the discount rate, pushes up house prices, making it easier for the non-rich to borrow against that collateral value, thereby increasing the amount of borrowing in the economy. So here is the first main result of the model, okay, what we call indebted demand. So start from a steady state and exogenously raise the debt service costs that borrowers are paying. Okay? The response of aggregate spending, what is that response in a world where we're in partial equilibrium in which the interest rate doesn't fall? In a homothetic model, it's not going to matter at all. Right? Because everyone has the same saving rate out of their income across the wealth distribution. So shifting money from borrowers to savers, because of course debt service is paid from the borrowers to the savers in this model, would not have any effect. However, in the indebted demand model, it's going to have an effect. The math is a bit nasty, but you can see right away that the DC is going to be negative if A to prime is greater than zero. So again, if marginal utility over wealth increases in wealth relative to the log case, then 
if you transfer money from the borrower to the saver in this model, you're going to get downward pressure on demand. Okay? And we're going to call that factor indebted demand. And if you want one line from this presentation, that I'm going to go through a bunch of experiments now, monetary policy, rise in income inequality, any force that leads to more debt by the borrower will ultimately put downward pressure on aggregate demand and therefore downward pressure on real interest rates. That's the key intuition of indebted demand and what really uh, comes about from this model. So let's run through a couple of important experiments. So the first is going to be a rise in income inequality. Okay, so that's very easy to do in this model. We just increase the endowment of the saver relative to the borrower. Okay, the total endowment always adds up to one, so it's just literally shifting the endowment over to the saver. In a homothetic model, everything is very boring. No, nothing changes. Um, there's no dynamics. You know, everything is just the same. Discount rate is rho. Um, the interest rate is rho. Same amount of debt. Where things get interesting is in a non-homothetic model. In a non-homothetic model, a rise in income inequality is going to shift the saving supply curve to the left. Okay, let's talk about the intuition about why that's happening. The way to understand that intuition is to first make sure you recognize that on the horizontal axis is the debt position of the borrower. Fix that. Okay, fix the debt position of the borrower. So imagine in your mind a vertical line, right? Let's assume that the debt position of the borrower is fixed, right? And I give more of the permanent income to the rich person, okay? Well, we know that the, the, the present value of their tree wealth has now gone up, right? Because we've given them more of the endowment, debt's fixed. So we know they're richer. Well, if they're richer, we know that saving is non-homothetic. They're going to want to save more. The only way to equilibrate this economy is to lower the interest rate to keep them from saving more, right? Because it's an endowment economy, there's no capital or anything. So you have to keep them from saving more so that that way the interest rate has to fall, okay? And so that happens, of course, at every point in D, and so you get a shift left in the saving supply curve. But then what happens? If you shift the saving supply curve, then we move from this point, right, down to this point. That is the equilibrium long run interest rate will have to be lower and the equilibrium amount of debt will have to be higher. What's mechanically happening, okay, now let's put our real world hats on. What the real world, what I think is going on is income inequality starts going up in the 1980s. Not surprisingly in our view, that's when real interest rates start to fall, okay? There's other stuff, of course, going on, demographics, anchoring inflation expectations, maybe productivity growth has been falling. We're not trying to say this is a unique factor, but we're saying that if income inequality goes up, you get downward pressure on interest rates. In the real world, what is that doing? Starting to push up price to rent ratios on housing, which also in the 1980s start to rise. That enables, just like in the model, that represents a shift along the debt demand curve. Right? Because L is fixed, LTV is fixed, but value is going up. That allows borrowers to borrow more. And so it's not surprising that most of the borrowing is happening in mortgages. It's happening in countries where price to rent ratios are going up the most. And so that's exactly what you'd expect in this model. So what this basically teaches you is that if you really want to understand the drivers of higher debt to GDP ratios, you got to understand what are the forces lowering the discount rate. Right? What are the forces lowering interest rates? Because we believe those are boosting up house values, which is then subsequently leading to more and more debt uh, taken on by the household sector. This is kind of an aside, but I wanted to emphasize it, especially for central bankers, because I think it's, it's something that's not very intuitive, um, but I think it, it actually makes empirical sense, which is financial liberalization. Let's suppose you have financial liberalization. In this model, we're going to raise the LTV ratio. Okay, that's what rep, uh, uh, financial liberalization means. In the standard model, that's of course going to increase debt. It represents the shift to the right of the debt demand curve. That's going to lead to more debt. Okay, that's kind of obvious. If you make it easier to borrow, people are going to borrow more. But you're not going to get any change in the interest rate. Okay, but if I were to survey you what you think would happen in, in most macro models, in the short run, at least, I think we all have the intuition that if you make it easier to borrow 
and saving supply is fixed, well then the interest rate has to go up, right, to equilibrate the market. You have a borrowing demand shock. But a mystery that's been shown by Justiniano et al. and others is that if you look across countries, if you do VARs and pulse response functions, it looks like interest rates actually come down when you do financial liberalization, you allow more borrowing. Well, that's exactly what happens in this model. Okay, so in this model, if you basically do financial liberalization, in the short run, the saving supply curve is upward sloping. I didn't have time to go through that today, but you can see the paper. So in the short run, you are going to get, this is the dynamics. Oh, I did it. I knew, I knew everyone's been doing it today. I knew I was going to do it once. Um, do I have to push something on here? Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, you're going to basically get, in the short run, a rise in the interest rate. But in the long run, you're going to get a decline in the interest rate. And what's the intuition? It's indebted demand. Any force that ultimately leads to more borrowing leads to more transfers from the non-rich to the rich. That puts downward pressure on demand. The interest rate has to fall in order to clear the economy. Okay, so this basically resolves a mystery in the literature, which is that financial liberalization in this model can actually lead to lower interest rates. Monetary policy. So I wanted to talk about one main policy implication. We also talk about fiscal policy in the paper. The discussion of fiscal policy is complicated by the convenience yield. If the government, I want to briefly just say this, if the government borrows at the same interest rate as the household sector, then fiscal policy also leads to indebted demand. And so you get this kind of counterintuitive result that in the long run, if the government spends more, interest rates actually fall, right? But that's, again, I, I think that's unique to a model in which you basically have safe government debt and that government borrows at the same interest rate as the household sector, which we don't think is very realistic. So that's why I'm not going to emphasize it here. We wrote our Goldilocks paper uh, on fiscal policy precisely as a follow-on because I think it has more realistic assumptions and has some uh, different predictions. Monetary policy, let me tell you how we're going to introduce it. Very standard, as in Verning. Uh, we're going to take some shortcuts just to make things really simple. Um, agents are going to supply labor LI. Actual output now can deviate from potential output, so we move away from the endowment economy. We're going to have downward nominal wage rigidity, but flexible prices. Keep the income shares constant. To make things simple, we're going to have the central bank just set the real rate directly. Um, and we're going to define RTN as the natural interest rate path that achieves potential output. Okay? So again, a lot of assumptions here, but we just want to make the basic point. We think the basic point is quite robust, and I think you're going to see the intuition uh, directly. Okay? So the intuition of what's going to happen here is, suppose the monetary policy maker does the following. Maybe because output's below potential, they say, look, we're going to lower the interest rate today. We're going to keep it low until cap T, at which point we're going to let it drift back to whatever the natural interest rate is at cap T. Now, in most models of monetary policy, the long-run equilibrium natural interest rate is independent of monetary policy. And so you're not going to actually affect RTN with this policy. However, in this model, you will affect the long-term interest rate if you do expansionary monetary policy. In fact, what you're going to do is you're going to lower the interest rate currently. That's going to boost the value of the trees that the borrower has. Think housing, right? Because you're going to lower the discount rate on the housing cash flows. That's going to allow the borrower to borrow more, okay? But now that the borrower is going to have a higher debt level, you've run into indebted demand. You're going to have more debt service payments going to the rich, and then ultimately that's going to lead to the natural interest rate falling. Okay? So expansionary monetary policy in this model not only temporarily lowers the interest rate, it has long-run effects on the natural interest rate of this economy because, again, you're boosting the amount of debt in this economy. So what does this look like in a picture? Here we have the, uh, the natural interest rate when the monetary policy start, starts. Right? We lower the interest rate here. On the uh, horizontal axis is time. Okay? And here is cap T. And you might think the monetary policymaker had in mind, well, I'll just let the, I'll let the policy drift back to the natural interest rate. 
right? But what happens in this model is you've now changed the natural interest rate. And in fact, if demand is, if, if, if uh, preferences are non-homothetic enough, you can get kind of a perverse effect, which is you can actually lower the natural interest rate below where you targeted during the intervention, okay? And we think this captures a lot of the intuition. In fact, I've been kind of recording even today. So many people have been saying casually, oh, when the debt service payments or when borrowers have more debt, it kind of hurts the economy. You know, we kind of say this. But of course, in a homothetic model, that's not true, right? Having more debt doesn't hurt anybody in a homothetic model because you're just representing more debt service payments from two people that have the same marginal propensity to consume in the long run out of permanent income. And so in this model, you get kind of that intuition that what you've done when you boost debt levels is you've kind of permanently lowered the demand at a fixed interest rate that the economy can sustain. And so you're putting downward pressure on the interest rate that can clear this economy. We like this because we think it captures a lot of the intuition of what you are hearing. This is right before COVID. So the Wall Street Journal did an article that says, you know, borrowing helped pull countries out of the recession, but made it harder for policymakers to raise rates. Mark Carney of the Bank of England uh, said in this article, the sustainability of debt burdens depends on interest rates remaining low. Okay, Philip Lowe of the Reserve Bank of Australia, I think this quote really captures the intuition, which is, once you've done the expansion and debt burdens go up, and those of you who know Australia, you know, house prices went way up in Australia, household debt burdens are very high in Australia. He says, if interest rates were to rise, many consumers might have to severe, se severely curtail their spending to keep up with their repayments. And so all of this captures the intuition that when monetary policy is very loose, it kind of traps the policymaker because now people take on more debt and now I can't raise the interest rate because I know it's going to hurt the economy, all those debt service payments that the, uh, the non-rich have to make. Okay, so I only, I want to make sure to leave a lot of time for questions, so let me go over this quick. Um, we do have a debt trap equilibrium in this model where let's suppose there's a lower bound on how low the natural interest rate can go, okay? This is not about monetary policy, you know, this is a monetary policy friction, but just imagine um, you're going to have some zero lower bound. Well, you could reach a steady state in which our lower bound is above the natural interest rate that naturally clears this economy, okay? So if that happens, then in this model, you get a stable liquidity trap steady state equilibrium, which we call a debt trap. Essentially, what's going on here now is people have essentially, the, the, if you want to think about it in terms of inequality, if income inequality goes up by so much that the equilibrium interest rate needed to clear the economy is below our lower bound, then essentially the economy can't generate enough demand. And so you basically get a stable steady, tra uh, steady state trap that we, uh, that we call a debt trap. This is definitely the most progressive part of the paper, you know, and I don't think we're extremely left-wing, <laughs> but, but in this part of the paper, it is the case that a wealth tax can really help, right? Because essentially, you can keep the saver completely indifferent and boost overall economic activity by doing transfers from the, from the saver to the debtor in this, in this paper, in this model. Okay, final thing I wanna say. How do we think about um, COVID, right? And we've been thinking a little bit about this. This is not a model designed to think about short run effects, right? So obviously I'm not talking about what's causing inflation today. I'm really thinking about what does this model have to tell us about where we're gonna be in three to five years. And I think it's really important to understand the data here are really from the US, but I, my guess is that this is happening in Europe as well is that this inflationary environment that we're living in has been characterized by pretty strong after-tax and transfer income growth of the non-rich. So the first time in probably about 20 years, we're seeing substantial gains in the US for people in the bottom 90% of the income distribution relative to those people at the top. Furthermore, if you look at the patterns after these big fiscal stimulus payments that we've made, a lot of that is 
spending, uh, there's been a really strong spending response by the non-rich. So I think when we're thinking about where in the long run inflation and equilibrium interest rates are going to be, I've been thinking a lot about whether these temporary changes are going to be more permanent. Will COVID be the shock that actually leads to long-term uh, decline in income inequality? Will actually reverse that trend that we've seen? My colleague Steve Davis at Booth is arguing that it could happen, and his argument is that, it's actually a very interesting argument, that work from home is disproportionately done by higher income people. There's an amenity value to that, and so you don't actually have to pay people as much who are at the top of the income distribution because they value working from home and they're able to do their jobs from home. Okay, I'm not sure I buy this argument, I'm just giving you the argument. And people in the lower part of the income distribution who have to continue showing up to work are actually gonna see permanent wage gains because essentially they don't get that opportunity for the amenity value. So my view is that if that occurs in the long run, then you could get long run changes in equilibrium interest rates. That is, you could get higher equilibrium interest rates if measures of permanent income inequality fall. Let me just show you two pictures and then I'm happy to open it up for questions. This is from uh, Gabe Zuckman's Real Time Inequality. Um, and he's showing you the after tax real income group by income group, uh, by, uh, I'm sorry, after tax real income growth by income group. And it's pretty dramatic, right? So this is, um, did it again, <laughs> sorry. Um, this is the, uh, let me go back one slide. This is the, uh, the income growth for those in the bottom 50% and the bottom 40, uh, and, the, and the kind of middle 40%. And really, when you're thinking about the wealth position, you need to integrate that number. I mean, there's been a, it's been a good time to be in the big bottom 50% in terms of income in the US. This is not just the transfers, by the way. It's a lot of its transfers, but some of it is actually pre-tax and pre-transfer income growth has been stronger. And then let me just show you the final picture, which is from the Chetty et al. work. In, this is the second stimulus payment and they're looking at spending by zip code. They only have spending by zip code in this paper. They don't have it at the individual level. But what they're showing is that in response to the stimulus payments, spending in low income zip codes went up a lot and it basically stayed up at least for the month afterwards. Whereas in the rich zip codes, it kind of basically stays constant in the long run, okay? So again, the point I'm making is that if you think about the inflationary pressures, if you think about higher interest rates needed by central bankers, I think you have to pay attention to the distribution of income, which is of course the point of this conference. So I think uh, you know, we're all hopefully working in, a, in an area that's gonna continue to be important as we think about the post-COVID world. So let me go ahead and conclude. Inequality matters. It matters for debt levels. It matters for interest rates. We think it could potentially matter for output if you think about this debt trap equilibrium. We think macroeconomic models and models of the financial system should recognize and incorporate the importance of inequality. And looking forward, I think that's the key question. Will we be back in a secular stagnation type equilibrium? We are really focusing on the evolution of uh, inequality and permanent income. So with that, I'll conclude and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> very interesting lecture.